Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Ramiro from Anticonquista. Anticonquista is an anti-imperialist media collective. Our content is produced by and for the Latin American and Caribbean diaspora. And today we're talking about a topic that is so important. A lot of people were hitting us up like, yo, when is the stream going on? Like, what, what are you guys talking about? You know, what's going on with China? We got some ultra left people who are like, oh, you're horrible. How dare you? We have some other people rooting us on who are like, yo, thank you for shedding light about China. But today we are discussing the governance of China by Xi Jinping. It's this book right here. Um, I'm just about in the process of finishing it, uh, almost done with it. It's a beautiful book. I actually got this copy in uh, in a bookstore in Beijing with uh, my girlfriend, Ophelia. We were out in China uh, last year before COVID hit. Um, we were having a good time getting to know the country and I got a copy of that book because that book is something that's so important for us as socialists, as communists to study. You know, China is the biggest country in the world in terms of population. Now, arguably in terms of economic size, China is probably the number one largest economy, definitely number two, if not number one. And so, and the Communist Party of China is the biggest, you know, political organization, biggest communist party. There's so much that we can learn regardless of whether you support the CCP or not, you know, we should be studying this, right? We should be understanding socialism with Chinese characteristics. Um, and so we're gonna be speaking with our good comrades from uh, Dave from the, the Chiao Collective. The Chiao Collective is a diaspora Chinese media collective challenging US aggression on China. They aim to challenge rising US aggression towards the People's Republic of China and to equip the US anti-war movement with the tools and analysis to better combat the stoking of a new Cold War conflict with China. How's it going, Dave? Hey, hey. Uh, thanks so much for having me. Really uh, excited to chat with you about uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics and particularly like, you know, what what we as anti-imperialists living in the West can can take away from it. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's so important for us in the imperialist core countries to study China to show the respect, because honestly, for me, one of the things that pisses me off as someone from the Global South, and I'm sure for you as well, Dave, is like for us as Global South revolutionaries, as communists, anti-imperialists, is when you have Western leftists who, you know, have claimed they know it all, claim they understand the world without having ever read a single word of Xi, a single word of anything that the Chinese Communist Party has put out and just automatically dismiss Chinese socialism, socialism with Chinese characteristics. And so now is the time to learn, right? And even Mao Zedong said himself, no investigation, no right to critique. And that's exactly what we want to delve into today is talking about Xi's important work, the governance of China, socialism with Chinese characteristics. And so that's exactly what we're going to be talking about with Dave. Before we get into reading some excerpts from the book, I do want to give you some background on the book itself. So The Governance of China is a three volume collection of speeches and writings by Xi, who's the sec general secretary of the Communist Party of China. In his book, Xi explains socialism with Chinese characteristics and his vision for a strong, united and prosperous China. The Governance of China consists of 270 pieces organized thematically into 54 chapters. He talks about everything from economics, politics, society, international relations, infrastructure, uh, uh, environmentalism, ecology, peaceful coexistence, the military. So if you really want to understand the ideology, the revolutionary ideology of the, the, the Communist Party of China and Xi Jinping, this is exactly the, the book to be reading. And just some quick background on Xi Jinping himself. Uh, he's a son of a Chinese communist veteran in the liberation struggle against Japanese imperialism. He worked in a rural uh, in, in a rural county, Yanchuan, I'm sure I'm totally butchering that name, uh, as a teenager during the Cultural Revolution. Uh, he lived in a village where he joined the CCP and worked as the party secretary. And after studying uh, chemical engineering at Tsinghua University, she became increasingly active in China's coastal provinces with the Communist Party of China. And he was the governor of Fujian province from 1999 to 2002. He later served as governor and party secretary of neighboring uh, a neighboring province from 2002 to 2007. Uh, he later joined the Politburo Standing Committee and served as the first secretary of the Central Secretariat in October 2007. 
And in 2008, uh, she was elected as Hu Jintao's successor as CCP leader, being appointed vice president of the People's Republic of China. In 2012, uh, assumed office as the general secretary of the Communist Party of China. And in 2013, he was elected president of the People's Republic of China, and he has been president since. And one of Xi's main accomplishments, which is for me, one of the most beautiful aspects of socialism with Chinese characteristics is the One Belt, One Road initiative, which seeks to bring development, win-win cooperation, not imperialism, not debt, debt traps as the, the Western Trotsky leftists like to claim, you know, cooperation, development, constructive socialism to the global south. And so that's exactly what we're going to be going on today. Before we go into reading the ex excerpts, we're going to be reading five excerpts from the book. Uh, let me just quickly list out those excerpts. The Chinese dream is the people's dream is the first one. The second one, second one is take targeted measures against poverty. The third one is promote socialist rule of law. The fourth one is promote supply side structural reform. And the fifth is green development model and the green way of life. So those are the five excerpts we're gonna be reading. I'm gonna be chatting with Dave. If you have any comments, questions, please put them in the chat. Again, this is a learning process. So please show respect for our guests, for our comrades for the the Chinese people and their struggle against capitalism and imperialism. Uh, Dave, before we start, why don't you give us a quick breakdown about Chinese history from the opium wars to the present? I know that's a lot to encompass, but I think it's important that we get a context, right? We have to understand the context of where this book is coming from, where she is coming from, because China has such a long history of suffering under the boot of imperialism that not too many people are aware of. And so I think that'll help guide this conversation. So why don't you give us some context for those of us who are unaware of just brief Chinese history? Sure thing. So just in the context of the CPC, uh, you know, they see uh, what they're doing is bringing back the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation because before Western imperialism, China, historically speaking, was you know one of the wealthier, well-off, more sophisticated civilizational states um, in, in in the world, and it was only uh, with the oncoming of Western imperialism that China really suffered humiliation. So, like you mentioned, with the Opium Wars, um, like a lot of the population got addicted to opium, so that the British could open up trade forcibly. And um, like at certain times, China was uh, occupied by, you know, different European nations, the same ones that are leading the Western uh, aggression on China today, like the US, the UK, um, Germany, and a bunch of others. And, you know, whenever China lost these wars, they, uh, whether it was against Western powers or also including Japan, um, they uh, were really, you know, the amount of war indemnities that they were uh, slotted to pay was on the order of, you know, three or five years worth of um, government revenues. So, like, they weren't really in a position to modernize, but actually uh, their material wealth in the country was exploited so that Japan could modernize, so that the West could modernize. So that's really, you know, the main takeaway from that, from the CPC's perspective, was that, um, you know, that they, and like before the CPC, basically during this century of humiliation in the 1800s, they were always um, like Chinese people were actually actively, you know, fighting back against imperialism. And they, they tried many different methods, you know, they tried, there were periods of, uh, you know, bourgeois, democratic, um, like attempts, but communism was really, uh, like Marxism, Leninism, with Mao Zedong thought was, was the thing that allowed the Chinese people to stand up and, and boot out uh, the imperialists. So, you know, they really see that um, there were errors made uh, by the Chinese, which was, um, you know, not like becoming closed off to the rest of society and not really taking on kind of like this technological progress. 
And so uh, what, you know, what the CPC has been doing through Marxism, Leninism with Mao Zedong Dot and um, its evolutions over time is really leading the Chinese people to um, be a strong, prosperous nation in the modern era. For sure. And it's such an inspiration for people from the global south. Myself, like my family's from Honduras and Honduras is one of the poorest countries in, in Latin America in the Western Hemisphere. And Honduras is currently run as a free market capitalist country. Everything is privatized. There's very minimal state presence. And that system has failed our countries of the global south of the, the quote unquote third world. And China shows an example of how having a structured, disciplined party that serves the people that is guided by serving the masses and developing the country, lifting up people out of poverty, how that can create prosperity for people around the world. And she also talks about it in his book. He says, this is not a cut and paste guidebook for people around the world. This is what has worked in China. And we have been able to, to flex and bend as needed here, adjusted to the local conditions. And so it's just ridiculous when people are saying like, oh, China's trying to spread its influence around the world and impose its model. It's like, no, like they they say very clearly, like this is works for China. Every country has their own process, right? Like in Nicaragua, for example, the Sandinistas were originally Marxist-Leninists and they incorporated some thoughts of Sandino as well. You know, in Venezuela, they have the Chavistas who incorporate aspects of Marx and Lenin and Mao as well, but also of Chavez. And so it's something that you adapt to the local conditions. And I think she does a beautiful job of explaining that later on. So let's go right into the first excerpt. Again, this is volume two of uh, the governance of China. Uh, there's three volumes. This is the volume that was published in 2017 and a volume three just came out this year in 2020. So I suggest everybody take a look at it. And again, it's like people ask, why are you reading this? Like, why is this? This is a book by the leader of arguably the strongest and most effective communist party in the world today, you know, that has lasted for decades, that is overseeing a country with 1.3 billion people lifting millions of people out of, out of poverty, regardless of whether you agree with it or not, you have to respect that and you have to understand what she is saying. And so that's what we're going to go into a little bit now. I think this first excerpt is one that really caught my attention. It's called the Chinese dream is the people's dream. And she says, since the founding of the People's Republic of China in 1949, and particularly since the start of reform and opening up in 1978, China has completed an extra, ex, extraordinary journey in which people of my generation have been personally involved. In the late 1960s, when I was in my teens, I was sent to a small village named Liangji in Yan'an, Shangzi province in Western China. There, I worked in the fields as a farmer for seven years. Like the locals, I lived in caves dug out from hills and slept on an earthen bed. The locals were very poor and they could go for months without even a bite of meat to eat. I grew to understand what they needed most. Later, when I became secretary of the village's party branch, I set out to develop the local economy because I knew what they needed. I very much wanted to see them have meat on their dinner tables again. I wanted to see that often, but that was a hard goal to attain. This spring festival, I went back to the same village, which now has asphalt roads, tile roofed brick houses and internet access. The elderly enjoy the basic old age pension. The villagers are covered by medical insurance and the children receive good education. Having meat for dinner is of course no longer a dream. This made me feel strongly that the Chinese dream is the people's dream and that if it is to succeed, it must be based on the Chinese people's aspiration for a better life. Changes in the small village epitomize the development and progress of Chinese society since 1978. In less than 40 years, we have boosted our economy to become the world's second largest supplying 1.3 billion people with food and clothing and basically achieving moderate prosperity. The people enjoy dignity and rights at an unprecedented level. These changes have not only affected the lives of the Chinese, they also signify remarkable progress in human civilization, 
and China's important contribution to world peace and development. Nonetheless, we are fully aware that China remains the world's biggest developing country. China's per capita GDP is only two thirds of the world average and one seventh that of the United States, ranking about 80th in global terms. According to our standards, there are still 70 million people living in poverty in China. According to World Bank standards, 200 million Chinese are still living below the poverty line. In urban and rural areas, 70 million people rely on subsistence allowance, and there are 85 million people with disabilities. Over the past two years, I have visited many impoverished areas in China and paid personal visits to families in need. Even now, I can still see their faces and feel their longing for a better life. All of this demonstrates that we in China must continue our hard work. Development remains the top priority for contemporary China, and the primary task of China's leadership is to focus on improving people's living standards and achieving common prosperity. It is to this end that we have put forward the two centenary goals. The first is to double GDP and the per capita incomes of urban and rural residents compared to 2010 levels, and to complete the building of a moderately prosperous society in all respects by 2020, as the centenary of the CPC approaches. The second is to build China into a modern socialist country that is prosperous, strong, democratic, culturally advanced, and harmonious, and achieve the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation by the middle of the century, which will see the centenary of the People's Republic of China. All that we are doing now is designed to accomplish these goals. We must achieve the first goal. In order to do that, we must drive reform to deeper levels. We must thoroughly implement the rule of law, and we must run the party with strict discipline. This is what we call the four-pronged strategy. So what'd you think about that uh, excerpt, Dave? I thought that was really beautiful. Uh, yeah, I mean, first piece is just that one thing that is beautiful about the Chinese dream is that it is a representation of of the mass line in China. So, you know, the mass line being the, uh, it's a connection between what, what the people's aspirations are and where the country's future is, which is becoming a modern socialist country. So, um, and it's also something that people, when they buy into it through their own work, they can create that future. So, um, and just for context, uh, in 1978, the GDP per capita in China was about $200. And today it's $10,000. So that means over the past 40 years or so, uh, the average Chinese person has seen their, their wealth increase by 50 times. So you're really seeing that as a socialist nation, they are able to create more wealth faster um, just as you would expect as, as a socialist country, you know, like they are able to put things in place where, um, capitalists are, um, you know, they're not the ones who are the, the primary decision makers about the future of the nation. So, you know, in referencing kind of what you were saying earlier about, um, you know, people's kind of potential, um, disagreements, uh, at the surface level of the CPC and China saying that, you know, they disagree with the CPC. Like my read into that is maybe you can say more about exactly what you think people mean, Ramiro, but uh, I would probably take it to mean that people want to prioritize class struggle. Uh, and and here in the Chinese dream, C specifically says that the, the central task is economic development. So, you know, how, like, I think there is, this is something we can just touch briefly on, but um, basically, you know, the reason why China developed socialism with Chinese characteristics was really based on the experience of the Cultural Revolution. During the Cultural Revolution, they actually did prioritize class struggle. And during that period, um, you know, they learn through practice, they seek truth from facts. And during that period, they actually did not see like huge gains in prosperity. Like during that period, um, you know, like we were saying 
in 2012, there was still um, maybe 100 million people in poverty. Um, and like I said, in 1978, you know, $200 per GDP per capita, that's, that's less than most African nations at that time, actually. So China was very poor. Um, it was still a backwards nation in terms of forces of production. So, um, you know, they found through practice that the, um, the prioritization of class struggle didn't really lead to um, progress in terms of in the socialism with Chinese characteristics framework, uh, didn't lead to progress in terms of the essence of socialism, which is the liberation and development of the productive forces, which is what China's doing now. And through the process of reform and opening up, that's really just saying that, um, you know, they, they do recognize that class struggle continues, but that in a socialist nation, uh, the correct way to handle that is through reform. And that means that you're unblocking kind of like the barriers, the social barriers, the relations of production that keep, um, you know, these backwards force, uh, kind of these backwards really uh, forces of production, keeping them back and unleashing them so that over time, um, you know, you can have a socialism that's rich where, where everybody gets rich. And that's, that's really, you know, people can, can actually, um, have the prosperity to, to enjoy full, full lives. So, um, you know, the Chinese dream is really a statement on that. And that just right now, um, you know, they say that they're in the primary stage of socialism. So that means that the primary contradiction in China, um, back when this was written, uh, they considered it to be, uh, between the ever growing material and cultural needs of the people and the backwards, the backwardness of social production. Uh, especially in the 70s and 80s, but they've actually um, entered a new era where, I, I mean, just to finish it off, uh, that's between, that's a, the primary contradiction has actually changed because China has become a moderately prosperous society where just a few days ago, right, they announced that they uh, actually eliminated absolute poverty in China, so, which is a huge achievement. Shout out oh, to China, man. man. That's beautiful. I know, right? Holiday. Dude, that and it's crazy because like, <laughs> despite of that, you still have people who are all like, yo, China's not doing shit. It's not real socialism. It's not doing this or that. And it's just like, it's beautiful to see because for people like us who come from global South countries where people are dying of hunger, like I've seen kids in front of my eyes, you know, uh, searching for food out of dumpsters, like have big bellies because they have stomach infections for China to be able to be like, yo, we're feeding all of our people. We're uplifting all of our people from poverty. I think that's something that's really beautiful. And it's also something that in the West and the Imperial core, a lot of people don't understand because on the right, for example, when, you, when we're talking about right now, the Chinese dream, right? And she was just talking about it right now in the section that we discussed, having meat for everybody to eat, you know, basic stuff, right? Everybody should have somewhere to live, food in their stomach, et cetera you know, compare the Chinese dream to the uh, the quote unquote American dream, right? Which is this idea of like, I'm going to have 10 convertibles. I'm going to have uh, skyscrapers named after me, like the kind of Donald Trump vision we have of the US. I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm going to own all these companies. And it's not based on sustenance and survival. It's based on wealth and greed and do whatever you want. And then on the left, uh, within the Western world, within the first world, you have a total focus on the destructive element of socialism. Because I think within socialism, we have to understand that there are two energies, right? There's like the constructive energy. My friend Caleb talks about this all the time. Shout out to Caleb uh, Moppin, who's also on YouTube as well. But there's constructive socialism that's talking about building hospitals, schools, education. You know, that's the real socialism, a class-based socialism that's based on lifting our people out of poverty. Then you also have the destructive element to it as well, where you're overthrowing the old order, right? You're overthrowing institutions of colonialism and slavery. And we support both, right? There, I think in revolutionary movements, there's elements of both. But I feel like in the Western first world imperialist countries, especially with the left, there's so much of a focus on the destructive part. And so if it's not people holding up AKs, if it's not people burning shit down, like people just don't care. But I think it goes down to like their 
in the lack of living in dire poverty, the, the way that people were living in China, like how you were just talking about before. So I think it's beautiful that China was able to accomplish that. And I think the Chinese dream is something that, you know, for every country you can have that, you know, if it's the Latin American dream, the African dream, uh, that's based on, on uplifting and serving our people. Shout out to everybody in the chat, by the way, shout out to uh, Robert Diaz, shout out to Douglas, shout out to everybody who's on here, shout out to uh, everybody from Anticonquista and, and Xiao Collective. So we're going to move on to the second excerpt, which is take targeted measures against poverty. And again, this is from the governance of China, Xi Jinping. And he says, quote, eliminating poverty, improving living standards and achieving common prosperity are the basic requirements of socialism and an important mission of the CPC. Building a moderately prosperous society in all respects is our fundamental promise to the people. We have sounded a clarion call in the battle against poverty. To win this battle, we should have firm resolve and solid goals and work hard with a down to earth spirit to bring reasonable prosperity to all poverty stricken areas and individuals by 2020. This conference on poverty alleviation and development is the first central conference since the fifth plenary session of the 18th CPC Central Committee. This shows this, the Central Committee's deep concern for poverty relief. At that plenary session, starting from our fundamental promise, we committed to raising out of poverty all those defined by current standards as rural poor, raising out of poverty all those counties designated as poverty stricken, and eliminating overall poverty by 2020. The major tasks of this conference are to implement the decision of the fifth plenary session, analyze the current situation, map out our work in the final period of achieving the goal of moderate prosperity, make both present and future plans to carry out the work required, and mobilize all forces of the party and the nation to win this battle against poverty. Since the founding of the PRC in 1949, the CPC has led the people in fighting poverty. Through 37 years of effort since we have adopted reform and opening up in 1978, we have followed a poverty relief path with Chinese characteristics and lifted more than 700 million rural people out of poverty, laying the foundation for a moderate prosperity throughout the country. China has lifted more people out of poverty than any other country, and it was the first to realize the United Nations Millennium Development Goals. This achievement deserves to be recorded in the Annals of Human Social Development, and it proves the worth of the CPC's leadership and Chinese socialism. We should be aware that China's battle against poverty remains tough. By the end of 2014, China still had a rural population of over 70 million living in poverty. Our poverty relief goals for the 13th five-year plan, 2016 to 2020, are as follows. By 2020, the rural poor will be guaranteed food, clothing, compulsory education, basic medical care, and safe housing. In poverty-stricken areas, the growth rate in rural per capita disposable income will surpass the national average growth rate and major indicators of basic public services will approach the national average. China's battle against poverty has entered the toughest stage. To achieve our goals, we must carry on the fight with firmer resolve, clearer thinking, and more targeted measures, unique intensity, and concerted action, leaving behind no single poverty-stricken area or individual. To take better targeted measures to help the poor and lift them out of poverty, we should improve their impact. The key is to find the right approaches, establish effective mechanisms, make real efforts in targeted policy making, and deliver real results in policy implementation. We should determine who must receive poverty relief and identify the population and poverty level of the truly impoverished and the root causes of their problems so as to implement targeted policies for different households and individuals. We should determine who is to implement poverty relief develop a working mechanism in which the central government makes overall plans, the governments of provinces and equivalent administrative units take charge, and governments at municipal, prefectural, and county levels implement the decisions. Government at all levels should define a clear division of labor, clarify their own responsibilities, assign specific tasks to designated officials, and produce a thorough evaluation of their performance. We should determine how to implement poverty relief. According to the different cases of poverty-stricken people in areas, we should adopt five measures. First, boosting the economy to provide more job opportunities. 
we should guide and encourage all people with the ability to work for a better future with their own hands and rely on local resources to end poverty. Second, relocating poverty-stricken people. Those who cannot escape from poverty locally can be relocated year by year in a planned and organized way. We should ensure smooth relocation and settlement and make sure those involved have the means to better themselves. Third, providing eco jobs for poverty stricken people. We should strengthen ecological restoration and protection in impoverished areas, increase transfer payments in important ecological areas, expand the scope of those eligible for preferential policies and enable impoverished people with the ability to work, to serve as eco workers, for example, as forest rangers. Fourth, improving education in poverty stricken areas. The best way to help the poor is to raise their educational level. National education funds should continue to be weighted towards poverty-stricken areas for basic education and vocational education. We should improve the education services in impoverished areas and direct particular attention to young children from impoverished rural households, especially children who stay in rural areas while their parents have gone to the cities as migrant workers. And fifth, improving social security for poverty alleviation. Among the poverty stricken population, those who have completely or partially lost the ability to work should be guaranteed social security. We should adjust the rural poverty line and rural subsistence allowances and provide other forms of social relief. We should increase medical insurance and medical aid for poverty relief and ensure the rural poor are covered by the new type of rural cooperative medical care and serious illness insurance. We should increase efforts in poverty relief in the old revolutionary base areas of the CPC from before the founding of the People's Republic of China. Taking targeted measures to help the impoverished means lifting them out of poverty. We should set a timetable, a step-by-step -step schedule to complete this poverty relief program, being neither over conservative nor over impetuous we should give a grace period in which we continue to implement poverty relief policies in designated poor areas that have eliminated poverty. We should evaluate the results of our work and against strict criteria and in terms of everyday household and individual units until they are recognized by the public. While taking targeted measures for poverty relief, we should enhance and improve the CPC's leadership. Party committees and governments at all levels must proceed with confidence take on responsibilities and do solid work to reduce poverty. Officials at all levels should press on with the work of poverty alleviation with passion and determination. In places where poverty alleviation work is tough, party committees and governments should take the fight against poverty as their top priority for the 13th five-year plan period and use it to promote local social and economic development. Authorities at all levels should sign written pledges concerning their goals. We should establish an annual report and supervision system for poverty alleviation to enhance accountability. Their actual performance in poverty alleviation should be a major criterion for selecting officials. We should test officials on the front line of the battle against poverty and encourage them to distinguish themselves. We should strengthen rural grassroots party committees, intensify the fight against poverty and select capable first in commands and leading groups. Our input in development-oriented poverty alleviation should be adapted to the requirements for victory in this battle. Accordingly, we should increase special funds and infrastructure investment in the state budget allocated to poverty relief. Transfer payments for general purposes and special transfer payments for improving standards of living should be further shifted towards poverty-stricken areas. Provincial budgets and eastern areas which are paired up with western impoverished areas for the purpose of fighting poverty should increase financial support for poverty relief. We should multiply efforts to integrate funds for poverty relief. To reduce poverty through financial measures, we should accelerate the pace of rural financial reform and innovation. We should promote transparent management of poverty relief funds, investigate every crime of abusing power in poverty relief, and severely punish those who embezzle, exploit, falsely claim, or squander poverty relief funds. To eliminate poverty, the impoverished should rely on their own hard work. There is no mountaintop we cannot reach. There is no voyage without a final destination. 
we should arouse the initiative of grassroots officials and people in poverty stricken areas and encourage them to act with passion and fight poverty through hard work. We should also mobilize all social forces to join in poverty alleviation. So that's a beautiful chapter from uh, Governance of China by Xi Jinping. Uh, Dave, what what uh, what do you think of that part? I think that was a really cool section. Yeah, I mean, I think most people's takeaways would just be, first takeaway is just that this is incredibly detailed. Like when you're talking about, you know, the party's approach to, um, you know, eliminating poverty, like they are really doing the work. That's why it's so detailed. And so, and I think, uh, you know, they're doing the work in terms of ensuring accountability, developing through practice, but also um, leaving enough guidelines where there's like local implementation. So there's support on all levels. So the party's really um, doing this work. And like you said, or, you know, like they were talking about, um, you know, people have to lift themselves out of poverty. Like the party is there to remove the barriers by providing infrastructure like roads or trains or um, developing industry. But there is a contradiction there where people are in the habit of, of, of poverty. And so with that, a big component of this work is also inspiring the people into action. And that's why it's that they, you know, lift themselves out of poverty through their own work, um, which includes the party. So um, that, you know, like kind of side note is um, I heard people say that uh, they say that in the U.S. politics is exciting and bureaucracy is, is boring. But in China, politics is boring and bureaucracy is exciting because bureaucracy is where you really put your you know, your hammer to the nail and like build the thing and figure out whether it works or not. So that's that's really what they're talking about with these um, with these measures. And another thing that's I think really notable in how their approach to this work is they listed five uh, targeted measures against poverty. What's really interesting is that each one kind of is is really reserved for a different kind of contradiction related to poverty. So when you look at the first one, you know, the major one is just, hey, let's uh, improve the economy. Let's let's build the infrastructure. Let's give people the support they need to to actually um, like have be, to participate in as part of the proletariat in like modern industry. But the other one is just like in some places, you know. A lot of the rural areas in China are uh, in the West, and they're kind of historically um, underdeveloped. And sometimes they're in high mountains or whatever. Like some places, some villages where people have been living in poverty, um, the CPC will determine that they can't. Uh, there's no potential for economic development there, so they actually do relocation. Right? They're like, oh. Given the character of this particular situation, we can't just magically make the economy better. We have to we have to do something else. But that's balanced between their third targeted measure, which was you know recognizing that the true foundation of wealth of the nation is you know clear skies, lucid waters, and you know like green mountains. Like it's the it's the wealth of the the natural environment. And so that's why they provide, they know that in some cases it actually makes more sense to protect the environment and, you know, get people, uh, get people the support they need to make sure that that happens. And in education for the future and social security, when all else fails, um, then that means like people, they're disabled, they, they actually can't make a living in the current conditions, uh, they have the minimum guarantee. So that's you can kind of see their tiered approach. And this was really found through practice. And these guidelines exist because they did the work, they summarized it, and then they uh, created structure to really scale it. So, you know, that's really the power of this, this approach to socialism. And it's, a, and it's ultimately a scientific socialism. And it's so, like you said, it's so specific and it's so 
based in reality, which is what's beautiful about it. Because even Mao himself says that theory comes from practice. You learn from doing. And this is exactly what Xi Jinping is talking about in his book. And it's so different from what a lot of Western left, first world leftists who focus on the theory, the theoretical realm. And they have the perfect theory written down, you know, the perfect name and this and that. But then in real life, it's like they're not really doing shit. And so it's just for me, it's one of my pet peeves when they have the balls to talk shit about China and to be like, oh, you're not that's not real socialism. And it's like they're dealing with everyday day to day problems, lifting people out of poverty and and doing such incredible work. And I think that that's something that in the West, unfortunately, leftists, you know, don't really understand or praise because it's not they're not talking about like, you know, let's go burn shit and fuck shit up. And it's like they're past that stage in the revolution. Revolution is a, so much more than just tearing stuff down and destroying the old order. It's about building a new order. And that's the stuff that the, the Chinese Communist Party and, and Xi Jinping is exactly talking about is bringing stability to the people. And so again, shout out to everybody in the chat. I see Caleb's in the chat. Shout out to Caleb, shout out to Sergio, shout out to uh, Rob, Diaz, Carl, everybody who's on here. We're gonna move on to excerpt three, promote socialist rule of law in the governance of China. To advance the rule of law in China, it is imperative that we take the right path. A false path will lead us to the very opposite of what we are trying to accomplish. And if that happens, no requirement or measure we introduce will work. There is a theme that runs through the resolution of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China on certain major issues concerning comprehensively advancing the law-based governance of China we have adopted at this plenary session, which is the necessity of keeping to and expanding the path of socialist rule of law with Chinese features. This path consists, constitutes an overall guideline. That is to say, China has achieved dozens of successes in its efforts to establish the rule of law, some large and some small. But ultimately, these achievements boil down to one thing, and that is the path of socialist rule of law with Chinese features. Frederick Engels once said, quote, a new program is, after all, a banner planted in public, and the outside world judges the party by it, unquote. In any initiative we introduce, the public will stand behind the CPC as long as it has a clear cut stand and the whole party is in full action. The worst mistake a ruling party can commit is to show indecisiveness on matters of extreme importance, encouraging arguments to rage and division to sow. Consequently, those with ulterior motives will fan the flames of discontent, lead the public astray and stir up trouble. In the end, there are bound to be problems, so there is no room for ambiguity in the question of our path. We must send a clear and correct signal to the public. The decision to advance the rule of law reflects the CPC's will to enhance its governance capacity. It did so not because of pressure. On the fundamental issue of keeping to and extending the path of socialist rule of law, we need to demonstrate both confidence and resolve. This is a major proposition but with many aspects that we need to explore and study in depth. But the fundamental elements of the path must be permanent. First, we must uphold the leadership of the CPC. Upholding the party's leadership is the essential feature of China's socialism and a fundamental guarantee for socialist rule of law in the country. In keeping to the path of socialist rule of law, the most important thing is that we uphold the leadership of the party. It was the party that proposed the rule of law in China and then made it a fundamental principle by which the party leads the people in governing the country. In addition, the party leads the people in advancing the rule of law in practice. Therefore, our comprehensive efforts to advance the rule of law must be conducive to strengthening and improving the party's leadership, bolstering its position as the government governing party and accomplishing its mission in governing the country. In absolutely no way does this amount to weakening the leadership of the CPC. Upholding the party's leadership is fundamental to socialist rule of law and is integral to comprehensive efforts to advance the rule of law in China. We need to uphold the party's leadership throughout the whole process and in every respect, in every aspect of the law-based governance of the country, ensuring that the party's leadership, the people's position as masters of the country, and the rule of law form an inseparable whole. Only when the rule of law is enforced strictly under the leadership of the CPC 
will the people fully realize their role as masters of the country. And only then will the introduction of the rule of law into national and social affairs take place smoothly. Upholding the party's leadership is not an empty slogan, but something that we must be that must be manifested in practice through the party's endeavors to lead legislation, ensure law enforcement, support the administration of justice, and take the lead in abiding by the law. On the one hand, we need to give play to the CPC's core role in exercising overall leadership and coordinating efforts from all quarters, bring all aspects of law-based governance under the CPC's overall planning, and ensure that the CPC's propositions are carried out throughout the whole process and in every aspect of the rule of law. On the other hand, we need to improve CPC leadership in law-based governance and continue to raise its capacity to lead in this regard. The party must exercise law-based governance and political power, confining its activities to the boundaries stipulated by the constitution and the law. And at the same time, it must also fully employ party organizations, members and officials as a leading political core and pioneer for enforcing the rule of law. Second, we must uphold the principal position of the people. China's socialist system ensures that the people assume the principal position as masters of the country. It also ensures that the people are the primary actors in advancing the rule of law. This is a strength of our system and the fundamental distinction between socialist rule of law with Chinese features and capitalist rule of law in other countries. To uphold the principal position of the people, we must develop the rule of law for the people and rely on them, and it must benefit and protect them. We must ensure that the people under the leadership of the CPC are able to administer state affairs and manage economic, cultural, and social affairs through various channels and in various ways as provided by law. Moreover, we must integrate representing the people's interests, reflecting their wishes, protecting their rights, and improving their well-being into the whole process of our law-based governance, ensuring that the will of the people is embodied, not just in laws themselves, but also in their enforcement. Just as the rights and interests of the people are protected by the law, the authority of the law must be maintained by the people. We need to motivate the public to actively involve themselves in the practice of the rule of law, enable the people as a whole to become devoted advocates, conscientious observers, and resolute defenders of socialist rule of law, and ensure that all share a common aspiration to respect the law, trust the law, observe the law, apply the law, and defend the law. Third, we must uphold the principle that all are equal before the law. Equality is a basic attribute of socialist law and a fundamental requirement of socialist rule of law. This principle that all are equal before the law must be reflected in all aspects of legislation, law enforcement, judicial practice, and law observance. All organizations and individuals must respect the authority of the constitution and law, confine their activities to the boundaries prescribed by the constitution, and exercise powers, enjoy rights, and perform duties and fulfill obligations in accordance with the constitution. No organization or individual would be permitted to enjoy special privileges that place them above the constitution and law. Whoever violates the constitution or law must face punishment. Under no circumstances can any individual under any pretext or in any way be allowed to arbitrarily override the law, place their power above the authority of the law or bend the law for their own personal gain. Officials at all levels shoulder an important responsibility in advancing the rule of law. Some party members and officials still think that the country is under rule by man. They consider that they are the ones in charge and believe that conducting affairs in accordance with the law is overly complicated and unnecessarily restricting. Convinced that they should have the final say in everything, they are totally oblivious to the existence of the law and are bent on overriding it with their authority at every turn. Not until this practice ends will we stand a chance of genuinely realizing the rule of law. It is therefore very important to make sure that officials those small number play a key role in implementing the rule of law. We need to make sure that they have the right mindset. We must guide officials at all levels to understand that maintaining the authority of the constitution and law means maintaining the authority of the common will of the Chinese Communist Party and the people. That safeguarding the inviolability of the constitution and law means safeguarding the inviolability of the common will of the Chinese Communist Party and the people. And that guaranteeing the enforcement of the constitution and law means guaranteeing the realization of the common will of the CPC and everyone involved. 
So that's an excerpt from, again, uh, the governance of China, Xi Jinping, uh, that is on promoting the socialist rule of law. And he kind of compares China's model of focusing on the people first before corporations as compared to the United States where you have killer cops, you have governors who allow killer cops to continue operating. It's such a big difference. What would you think of that section, Dave? Yeah, I mean, just like you said, you know, this is really talking about the socialist rule of law, which is a different kind of law than what we know living in capitalist countries. Capitalist rule of law is all about, you know, you know, who makes the law? It's the, you know, it's the it's the lobbyists and the capitalists who pay them. Like in 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 China, it's it's totally different. Like the socialist rule of law is actually a weapon by the people to to be able to uh, prevent excessive exploitation, to be able to navigate contradictions among the people. And so, you know, when they're really talking about uh, people being the the principal aspect of this socialist rule of law in terms of, you know building it, maintaining it, um, really internalizing it. What they're really talking about is uh, developing socialist consciousness. You know, like the rule of law plays a role, not not the only role, but um, it, it plays a role in terms of as people um, with this and with this socialist rule of law, as as it as people begin to actually trust the law, because, you know, right now, this isn't something that is completed in China. It's an ongoing project. Like they're building the socialist rule of law. Um, you know, they're 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 transitioning between the rule of man to the to, to the rule of law. And so they, they are talking explicitly about, you know, how can we ensure that the party really leads in observing the law so that the people can trust it as a tool. You know, like just like how you know, back in 1947 in China, where peasants, despite being, you know, exploited for uh, thousands of years by by landlords under the feudal system, they, they were afraid to stand up because they didn't, they've seen that, you know, tool of 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 um, rebellion against the landlord fail time and time again in the past. They they had they had to see they had to you know along the mass line be kind of led by the party to to find the correct way to actually overthrow and abolish landlords. Um, and just the same, uh, you know, the law hasn't always been um, something that you could rely on. And and here they're really trying to to instill that, to be to be a, a core strength of something that will safeguard um, socialism in China, something that can, you know, that can restrain corrupt officials. Something that can uh, make the strong, make the country actually more unified and and more cohesive in, in terms of acting together and acting with the spirit of of what it is that the that the workers need in China. Um, and just to clarify, you know, they talked about one thing. I think that deserves extra commentary is they talk about um, you know the socialist rule of law still maintains the leadership of the party. So I think people could hear that without any context and be like, oh man, like that means it's authoritarian, right? Like the party's still deciding. But what they're really talking about is, you know, when they talk about party leadership, party leadership is really, you know, talking about the Chinese dream. It's talking about coordination between what you need to do in order to eliminate poverty. You're talking about how you prioritize different contradictions within China and how do, how do you resolve them? How, how do you put it into practice to figure out, you know, how to iteratively build knowledge to be able to uh, move past, you know, these contradictions to, to newer contradictions. And that, that's the leadership of the party, um, you know, and, and a bit, a bit later, well, yeah, that's the leadership of the party and like, the, the law is something that the party abides by. Like none of those things really, um, you know, as they go through those changes, that, that's what reform and opening up is. Reform is constant, like managed upheaval <laughs> to change vested interests 
into interests that align with the modernization of China into a developed modern socialist country. So, you know, um, what they talk about is they want to, they actually want to change the law before they implement a reform. You know, changing the law precedes the reform so that the people can trust it. And it's something that should properly constrain and guide the party. It's not, and, and, and that's, that's, that's what the main confusion is. Because in the West, when you talk about the rule of law, you really talk about procedural democracy. You know, if it follows these rules, it's democratic. You know, like we have law in the West, so we have a democracy. But <laughs> that's not what we're, you know, that's, that's not, that's totally on its face super false because you see the outcomes. You, you just compare it to the reality and you know um, that, that um, just procedural, the, you know, defining democracy just in terms of a process, you know, <laughs> we're not going to have the law replace the, the primary role of the party, which is to lead, you know, the workers of China to socialism and then communism. Yeah, for sure. Because like even, um, you know, like I was telling you before, Dave, like my family is from Honduras and they have a rule in the constitution that says no president can be reelected. And every four years there has to be like a new president, whatever. Not only have a lot of people violated that, but it doesn't mean anything. If, if in fact, it's actually made the country worse because then you have every four years some new guy who comes in with his own vision, own plan. And most of the time it ends up being a right-wing capitalist. And so they have no long-term vision and strategy for the country and it's so short term. And so like these Western notions that we have of like democracy and, and parties and you have to have people come in and out are so flawed. And I think that socialist rule of law is so important. And I like the fact that Xi Jinping and the, the Communist Party of China also understands that the state is a weapon. One of the main trends in the Western left today, unfortunately, is the emphasis on anarchism, on a lack of political parties, on lack of order uh, against any, against all authority, right, is the trendy hip uh, slogan to say and to promote out there. And one of the problems with that is that it fails to understand the state and laws for what they really are. And as Marxists, as people who are students of historical materialism, we understand that the, the economics of society, the base, controls the superstructure, the legal foundations of a country. And so regardless of whether you support a state or not, there's always gonna, there's always gonna be forms of governance and laws as long as class society exists. And so instead of, in China, instead of being like, oh, we don't want to replicate the violence of the, the Qing dynasty or, you know, they're gonna like, they're saying, no, we're gonna uh, use a state as a weapon to suppress the ruling class, to suppress the, the billionaires or people who want to destabilize China. And we're gonna use the laws to keep people in place, keep people in check, to make sure that what they're doing is truly benefiting the people. One of my favorite things about China is that they have really uh, wealthy billionaires or people who have uh, made money in, in certain corrupt ways go on, on television and, and apologize. And, and I think that sort of transparency is something you don't see in a lot of countries, and I, which I think is really cool. Before we move on to the next section, Dave, I wanted to also ask you, what is your response to people who claim that China is, that that the, the Communist Party of China is suppressing the real opposition? We always hear it in Western media about the, the real communists in China or these real Marxists. What is your response to people who say that? Um, I guess, you know, the CPC is a, a 90 million member party. So it's, it's really large. Um, and, you know, when you talk about poverty alleviation, just as an example, um, what that looks like is there's a person who's like visiting every single uh, household in a village and they, they, you know, talk with them, help them with their problems. And they're the people, you know, they, have, they do have to develop a line of trust, but that's the person that people go to for, for support. You know, that's a person who is, is going to brainstorm with them about like, Hey, what kind of industry would make sense for our, you know, our place, our culture, because, you know, there's minorities in China, so it might be a little different and kind of like uh, all that. So, um, you know, 
when you look at kind of objective measures, even like there was a Harvard study recently that came out uh, talking about what is um, people's satisfaction or how much they trust the the government of China. And, you know, the central government is over 90 percent. So compared to that, like the U.S., you know, I, and there's multiple measures, multiple international measures. Um, and like just most most people see, most people have seen the progress that China has made. And um, that's why that's why they trust, uh, that's why they trust the government. And that's why they, they think that China is headed in the right direction, which is one of those other surveys where over 90, maybe 95% of people respond that China's heading in the right direction. Um, so U.S. could be, you know, 40% or below for that kind of thing. So just no comparison, really, uh, for when you compare it to a Western context. And for these, I know that there are kind of, um, like within China, there are people of different political ideologies within China, right? So not everybody's part of the CPC. There's liberals, there's ultra leftists. So if, you know, if what you're referring to um, are maybe attempts by ultra leftists to like prioritize class struggle over um, economic development in China uh, because they're impatient. They they see, you know, they it's it's confusing because they do see they see real problems, right? Mm -hmm. There is exploitation in China. There is people who are poor. There's people who work really long days. There's there's all kinds of problems in China. Uh, the thing to be careful about is all those problems are also problems that all societies share. And it's it's either A, a universal problem, or B, a problem that they inherited and that they're working on. But you really have to dig deep to really know whether it's really a problem caused by the socialist system in China. And, you know, what are they doing about it, right? So these, you know, ultra leftists might have a different theory of change about like, you know, what, what do you do? But, um, and I think when you look at, you know, the kind of work that they're doing and the kind of support that they have from other people, I would say it's very inconsequential. Yeah. A lot of those people conveniently get money from like the national endowment for democracy and all these U S think tanks. And it's part of that strategy of attacking the left from the left, that imperialist strategy of, creating this revolutionary opposition and that's heroic. And we saw that, you know, with the stuff going on in, in Hong Kong, like a year ago. And, and so, you know, I'm glad that y'all were able to call that out. Yeah, I guess I was thinking of, um, of things happening in mainland China for what we're talking about is Hong Kong specifically. Um, Hong, like Hong Kong is legitimately more complicated just because of one country, two systems where Hong Kong, does operate according to capitalism. Like you can sit down and read their thing. Like they have a different system. So the character of the contradictions are different and it's it's harder to get them resolved. But, um, you know, I really think that if they had any kind of like good faith connection to the, to the mainland and what was happening there, um, they would see that um, that there's been tremendous progress for workers. People do trust the government and like, like the CPC is really on their side, actually. If they if they want a better a better life, I think um, the CPC is is definitely there um, to support them, and to the extent that they can within the the constraints of the one country two systems, which for historical reasons has given um, like wealthy corporations, individuals more power vis a vis the people in Hong Kong versus what it's like in mainland China. Yeah, no, that's a great point for sure. Cause it's totally different, right? Like the conditions when I, I went to China, like I mentioned in 2019, it was beautiful. You know, Feli, I went there and the respect that people have for law and police is different than the United States. And it's something that to a Western audience, like you're like, what, like, how can you respect police and law in, in other countries? But when you have socialist rule of law, it's a totally different game. So the next excerpt uh, that we're going to read from the governance of China uh, by Xi Jinping is promote supply side structural reform. So she says, at last year's Central Conference on Economic Work, I emphasized supply side structural reform. 
This caused a lively debate and won some recognition both domestically and internationally. Some colleagues later told me that they were not quite clear about the concept and the related discussions. Here, I would like to explain in a little more detail. First, I wanna make it clear that supply side structural reform we have raised is different from that of conventional Western supply side economics. We cannot see it as another version of the latter. We must prevent people from using it to advocate neoliberalism or to disseminate negative press reports. Western supply side economics emerged in the 1970s. At the same time, at the time, the demand management policies of Keynesian economics were failing, resulting in the stagnation of Western economies. Supply side economics emphasizes that supply creates its own demand. So supply is the key to economic development. To increase production and supply, tax cuts are a must to improve savings, investment capacity, and initiative. This is the quote Laffer curve invented by the leading supply side econom economist, Arthur Laffer. Moreover, supply side economics holds that tax cuts demand two conditions. First, reducing government expenditure to balance budgets. Second, restricting monetary supply to stabilize prices. Supply side economics emphasizes tax cuts and overstates the role of tax rates. This theory is too definite, emphasizing supply while ignoring demand, emphasizing market functions while ignoring government intervention. What we have raised is supply side structural reform. As I mentioned at the 2015 Central Conference of Economic Work, the word structural is critical to the full expression, although we can call it supply side reform for short. The key to our supply side structural reform is to release and develop productive forces, to adjust structures through reform, to reduce ineffective and lower end supply while increasing effective and medium and high end supply to make supply structure more adaptive and flexible to changes in demand and to increase total favor productivity. This is not only about taxation and tax rates. It is a strategy designed to resolve China's supply side problems through a string of policy measures, in particular by promoting innovation and technology, by developing the real economy, and by improving the standard of living of ordinary people. Our supply side structural reform emphasizes both supply and demand, aims both to supply productive forces and to improve relations of production, allows the market to play its decisive role in allocation and government to fulfill its functions, and looks both present and future. From the perspective of political economics, the fundamental goal of our supply side structural reform is to improve the country's supply capacity so as to meet the people's material, cultural, and ecological needs, which are becoming more extensive, more sophisticated, and more individualized, and ultimately realize the purpose of socialist production. Supply and demand are the two, basic inner, the two basics of the inner relationships of the market economy. They are opposite and unified, interdependent, and mutually conditional. New demand generates new supply, while new supply generates new demand. Supply side and demand side are two basic means of macroeconomic regulation. Demand side management addresses economic aggregate problems, focuses on short-term macro regulation, and propels growth mainly by adjusting taxation, fiscal expenditure, and money supply to stimulate or restrain demand. Supply side management tackles structural problems, creates growth drivers, and boosts growth by adjusting the structure of production to improve the quality and efficiency of the supply system. Reviewing world economic development, we can see that whether a country focuses its economic policies on supply side or demand side depends on its macroeconomic situation. It is a one-sided perspective to ignore either of them. Supply side and demand side do not replace each other, but coordinate with each other. Now and in the future, China's economic development is facing and will encounter problems on both the supply side and the demand side, while major problems exist in the former. For example, some industries have severe overcapacity problems. However, we are still relying on the import of key equipment, core technology, and high-end products, and the vast domestic market is not in our own hands. For example, agricultural growth has maintained good momentum, but the supply of agricultural produce is not adaptive to changes in demand. Milk has not met the demand for quality and won public trust. 
There is a shortage of soybean while corn is overproduced. Agricultural produce in general is overstocked. For example, despite great purchasing power, our consumption demand cannot be met by domestic supply. Much money is spent on outbound shopping tours and overseas online shopping for goods ranging from jewelry, cosmetics, brand handbags, watches, clothes, and other luxuries to electric cookers, toilet lids, milk powder, feeding bottles, and other daily necessities. Statistics indicate that in 2014, China's outbound travel expenditure exceeded 1 trillion RMB. These facts prove that China is not short of demand, but the supply of quality products and services fails to keep up with the changing demand. Inadequate effective supply has caused spillover in demand and a severe outflow of consumption. To resolve these structural problems, we must promote supply side reform. Profound changes are afoot in the international economic structure. The global financial crisis broke the global economic circulation in which developed economies in Europe and the US relied on borrowing driven consumption. East Asia provided high saving rates and a cheap labor force and products, while Russia, the Middle East, and Latin America provided energy and resources. As a result, effective demand in the international market has fallen sharply, and economic growth lags far behind potential production capacity. In major countries, the problem of population aging has become more severe. The growth rate of the working population is decreasing. Social costs and production costs have risen rapidly. Traditional industries and their growth have declined, and emerging industries have not gathered sufficient size and growth momentum. Against this background, we need to start with the reform on the supply side to, to clarify our position in the world supply market. Domestically, China's economy is facing four problems, namely a slowdown in the, in the growth rate, falling prices of industrial products, falling business profits, falling fiscal revenues, and rising economic risks. The major causes of these problems are not periodic, but structural. The supply structural mismatch is severe. As the marginal benefit of demand management falls, overcapacity and other structural problems cannot be resolved simply by stimulating domestic demand. Therefore, we must concentrate our efforts on improving the supply structure so as to push the supply demand balance to a higher level. To promote supply side structural reform, we should start with production. The key is to resolve overcapacity effectively, promote industrial restructuring, reduce enterprise costs, develop strategic emerging industries and modern service industries, increase the supply of public goods and services, and ensure that the supply structure is more adaptive and flexible to changes in demand. In short, measures are required to cut overcapacity and excess inventory, deleverage, and reduce costs. In recent years, a number of Chinese enterprises have succeeded in promoting experimental supply-side structural reform. For example, various cell phone brands have competed fiercely in the domestic market. Both foreign brands like Motorola and Nokia and domestic brands pushing some to the edge of bankruptcy. In response to the situation, domestic cell phone enterprises upgraded production, promoted original innovation, aimed at the high-end market and launched high-end smartphones. These smartphones have met the demand for more functions, higher speed, clearer images, and more fashionable appearance, thus seizing an increasing market share in both domestic and international markets. The international cell phone market also features fierce competition. Once monopolistic brands such as Motorola, Nokia, and Ericsson no longer hold sway, some no, no longer even exist. After New Year, I visited a company in Chongqing. The thin film transistor liquid crystal display they produce is a successful example of supply side reform. In recent years, Chongqing has developed the industries of laptops and other intelligent terminal products, as well as Chinese brand automobiles, forming the world's biggest electronic information industrial cluster and the country's biggest automobile industrial cluster. One of every three laptops in the world was made in Chongqing. This proves that as long as we advance supply side reform aimed at the market, industrial upgrading can be achieved. Based on international experience, a country's development is fundamentally driven by the supply side. Time after time, technology and industrial revolution 
have improved the productive forces, creating an unimaginable supply capacity. Nowadays, socialized mass production has a distinctive feature. Once historic innovation has been achieved on the supply side, the market will respond with immense trade volume. According to one article at the Meta Council on Emerging Technologies, a panel of 18 experts compiled the list of the top 10 emerging technologies of 2015. These were fuel cell vehicles, next generation robotics, recyclable thermoset plastics, precise genetic engineering techniques, additive manufacturing, emergent artificial intelligence, distributed manufacturing, sense and avoid drones, and others. Last year during my visit to the UK, Professor Konstantin Novoselov and Professor Andre Game of the National Graphene Institute of the University of Manchester told me about the R&D of graphene and its application prospects. Graphene is a promising new material that is winning forceful support from the British government and the European Foundation for Research. Technology innovation has brought scientific progress and will add impetus to economic growth. Therefore, to push forward supply side reform, we must uphold the new development concepts and vigorously develop new technologies, industries, and forms of business so as to continuously provide endogenous impetus for sound and sustained economic development. Wow. <laughs> what do you think, Dave? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, supply side structural reform, they're talking about uh, first changing the way things are today. So deleveraging and restructuring and then investing in uh, these, these technologies that you just listed. So, you know, to understand the first part, it's kind of like back again in, 19, in the 1940s, like in China, when it was still a semi-colonial, semi-feudal state, the standard practice back then was that landlords with extra money uh, would just bury silver underground. They would hide it. And that's because there wasn't a mechanism to actually utilize this excess capital to actually build the forces of production. So it stayed poor. That was, that was the outcome. In, in the current situation, what they're talking about is actually something similar, but just in the context of a, of a more modern era. So you have, you know, a lot of capital that's just sitting idle because it, you have overcapacity. Um, you have, you, you've overinvested in certain factories, they're just not doing anything. And so there's, like China, for example, has um, like one of the highest saving rate in, in the world. So there's a lot of money just lying around, the equivalent of just burying money underground. like. We kind of see the the damage that does like in the West today, right? Like um, there's like trillions of dollars in the, in the housing market, and what if you use that money to to invest in in people's needs? So China's kind of looking at you know a similar, somewhat similar situation, and they're saying like, hey, let's uh let's uh unlock this potential to to really unleash the forces of production, and you know. When you know what's the outcome of that going to be like? I think um, uh, you know it. Like I think there is some thought that it could be kind of like mindless consumption. You know, it's just like oh, it's shallow, it's pointless. Like you know, sees going on about fancy cell phones. Like who cares about fancy cell phones? <laughs> like you know, representative of how like you know debauchery of morals and just like alienation or something like that. But I, like, I think, you know, at its best, it could be something kind of like, uh, you know, we, we do own things that we use for a purpose. And so kind of like referencing Marie Kondo about things that spark joy. When you talk about supply side structural refor reform, you're talking about being able to make things that people really enjoy um, to, to ever greater extents to meet like ever increasing needs as people get accustomed and have, have different contradictions that they want to resolve. So yeah, um, yeah like um, yeah, the supply side structural reform, it, 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 it's a, just a very, and in, in the specifics, it's just a coordinated process to, you know, look at the details of, you know, what's holding us back and like, where, where, where is the future going and investing in that. And, um, that's the supply side structural reform. For sure. And I think it's a good point that you mentioned because it's like a lot of people have to understand that the masses, the people want, you talk to everyday people, 
in a day-to-day -day conversation, people who have no idea what socialism is, what communism is, what they want from a system is something that will lift their standard of living. You can't build socialism on poverty. You have to elevate the, the forces of production in the country. And socialism has to be, be based on abundance and not scarcity. And that was one of the big errors of a lot of socialist movements in the 20th century is that immediately they just wanted to nationalize everything, immediately wanted to uh, redistribute. And there, you know, and this was happening in, in some places where the, the technology and the, the wealth was so low because of colonization and, and imperialism. And so it's like, you have to elevate the standard of living of the, of the people or else the people are not gonna have your back anymore. They're gonna start, you know, they're not gonna wanna support your party and your movement. And I think that that's what the, the is one of the brilliant aspects of the Communist Party of China is that it's able to adapt and be like, yo, you know what? People do want to have cell phones. People do want to have decent clothing, decent place to live. And at first, like I went through a stage, like when I first became a communist, when I was like, oh, like why, like fuck that, you know, the, the problem is that people have materials, let's, we need to go back to the way things were, you know, before technology. And that's kind of like the dominant view that we have today in a lot of the first world West where you have people who glorify like the past, who think the issue is too much technology and Chinese socialism. And I think what Xi Jinping is emphasizing here is that like the people are gonna want technological leaps history is going to continue advancing no matter what. And we have to advance with it. We have to develop our technology with it. But instead of like just allowing other countries to flood our markets with their shit, let's create our own stuff. Let's build our own cell phone companies. Let's build our own purse companies. Let's build our own construction companies and elevate it. Because no matter what, the people are going to want that. And they should have that. I think working class people should have a decent phone, a decent place to live, a car, you know, that that's something that people deserve. Now the issue is how are you gonna bring that to them? And and that's exactly why a lot of people in the Western left, ultra lefts critique China, uh, especially after 1978, after the reform and opening up, because they say, oh, China's capitalist, China's neoliberal, China's imperialist. Uh, Dave, we're not gonna have time to go to excerpt five from the book. We can go on and on. It's just such a beautiful book. But before you head out, um, what I wanted to kind of just go through some of the common talking points that people have about China and to just debunk them, uh, maybe we can start off with what is your response to people who claim that China is capitalist and imperialist? Yeah, sure. So uh, regarding imperialism, uh, China hasn't invaded another country over the past 40 years. That's why it's been able to actually become super wealthy because it's not spending money on war and it's been able to invest in the prosperity of its people. And that's different from the, the history of China uh, somewhat recently. It's been at war for a long time because of colonialism. So um, it's also in the constitution, um, you know, it's a, it's a peaceful nation. You can look up their foreign policy of multilateralism, but you know, when you look at kind of like their relationships with other other countries. I think recently the foreign minister of Venezuela was and and Maduro were were talking about um, you know their relationship with China and they were saying yeah China actually uh, ignored unilateral U.S. sanctions on Venezuela was able to deliver capital to the country so that it could develop. They were able to deliver pandemic supplies um, during the height to to keep uh people safe in venezuela and that was that was solidarity um and then when you talk about um you know but then you 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 look at like the loans for example that china is giving to these countries and they that's when you're like oh china's capitalist china's <laughs> really trying to exploit them um like for that aspect uh, first of all you know china just recently during the pandemic, because people are having trouble servicing debt, they have, you know, halted the the collection of payments so, so that people could spend money on on what they need right now. So China has a sense of priority. They've also, um, in when you kind of look at the record, they have actually, because what they're looking at is they're really prioritizing um, the relationship between countries. So sometimes they actually do cancel debt 
basically. Um, like, and when you look at China's position, um, like they are a developing country, right? Or you could say that they're like a, a moderately prosperous society starting now, but um, like they're not exactly in a position to like give stuff away. What they look for is mutual benefit. And that's what the that's what the foreign minister was talking about. He was like, "Hey, you know, China gets to like we we have a relationship of mutual benefit." And the way that kind of works is that because of China's um, like you know economic policies, where like the supply side structural reform, they actually do have an excess of capital, so they're able to get a win win where they're able to. Um, invest in other nations, develop their markets, and have a place for what could be overproduction, have a market for it to go to. Uh, that That's something that's taken place within China. They call it one plus one is greater than two, where actually the coastal regions are more developed than the West uh, because of historical reasons. And so you, you kind of see this transition where like, as the coastal regions develop, um, like they're able to get you know, like cheaper labor that's educated from the West, but also like when they kind of outgrow those industries and move higher up the value chain, those industries actually move within China and they're able to develop scale. And and like um, what you're seeing like with the recent passing of the RCEP, which is kind of like a free market, um, like no a no tariff zone in Asia that is historical because it makes it so that it's the largest, I think it's the largest trading block now. Um, and between like Asian kind of Asian countries and like, that's going to make it so that um, everybody can benefit basically. And like, uh, like when, like, so basically like China is, I, I guess kind of the main like ideological blockers really just thinking about markets itself. So, you know, a market is a tool. It's a mechanism where supply meets demand. Um, and what China has innovated with socialism with Chinese characteristics is market socialism. It's socialism because it's really advancing the forces of production. It's making it so that China has the prosperity to um, be able to um, increase the need, like to meet the needs of its people and to do so in a way, it's really the first country to modernize or one of the only countries to modernize without going to war. You know, historically speaking, most countries require the profits of imperialism, of war in order to industrialize. And China has been able to do that um, basically through party like wise control and market socialism. Like they, you, you see just when they implemented it, they were able to significantly increase their rate of growth so that they were able to lift people out of poverty. And um, actually now, just like with Venezuela, actually able to extend, um, you know, important economic ties that help buoy uh, these nations that are under threat by US-led Western imperialism. Um, they're able to provide capital in a, in, in a similar but different way than the, that the USSR was able to kind of support socialist countries back then. Yeah, yeah. Well, well said, Dave. Well, on that note, thank you so much. I know you have plenty of stuff. Y'all are very busy doing great work with the Chiao Collective, and I'm not going to hold you up any longer. Uh, but we just finished talking about the Governance of China by Xi Jinping. I got this copy in China. I think you could get some copies online uh, on, on Amazon or other places. I'm not too sure where. Uh, but Dave, before you head out, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about some of the work that y'all have been involved with recently with the Chiao Collective, uh, how we can follow and support the collective and anything that you wanna put on our radar moving forward? Yeah, you know, um, you can go to our website which is uh, chowcollective.com. Um, you know, we've got some really great reading lists and articles, the purpose of which is really, when you're talking about um, as an anti-imperialist 
about your relationship to China, doing so, treating your relationship so that it's one of critical support. So like in that sense, what, what I would request people to do is um, in terms of support, just realizing that we're in the new code war, that like you're gonna see huge campaigns of disinformation and really like propaganda aimed at demonizing China. And um, that, that aim is to prepare people for war on China. And so as an anti-imperialist, you, you would want to oppose that. And like a lot of our articles really speak to the character of the latest um, drives of propaganda. So one of our most recent articles is called The End of Engagement, talking about how, you know, whether it's Trump or Biden, um, that they're gonna continue the new Cold War and what is the history of that? And so that we can kind of see clearly how we can get to the facts and find and and um, support China from this Western imperialism, as well as, you know, we also publish kind of, you know, just like this article, I mean, just like this, um, this live stream or other things, like when you're looking at, you know, studying socialism in China, like the the piece that I would ask people to do is, uh, if you're interested in it, um, definitely think extra about how you can take those lessons and apply it into your day to day. You know, like like when we're looking at the Chinese dream, like in your context, like what is something that would unify people um, to fight? When you're talking about um, when you're talking about um, like the poverty and kind of like the detailed way of doing it, you know, like like how can I do my work in a more detailed way so that every comrade is even more accountable so that we can measure and figure out what what is correct action? Um, how can we make it so that people are actually, you know, with the rule of law, the socialist rule of law, people are actually participating in 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 the struggle to, to actually advance, you know, both socialist consciousness and whatever the material work that needs to be done, uh, regardless of whether it's explicit in, uh, antagonisms aimed at the ruling class or, or some other, um, some other primary contradiction in your context. Um, so I think there's there's really a lot to learn from like uh, just like the theme of, of this session um, from studying socialism with Chinese characteristics. Um, that's that's something that we're actually working on. Uh, if you want to, you can go down to the bottom of the page at chatcollective.com, sign up for our email newsletter and you'll get um, a notice when we put out our reading list on socialism with Chinese characteristics. Uh, not yet released, but something that could, uh, would eventually be upcoming. So yeah. For sure. No, well said, Dave. And, and again, we put the link to Dave, to Chiao Collective's website on the description of this video. Make sure to go to their website. Make sure to follow them on Twitter, IG. They have some really great content posts. Support them. This is exactly the kind of material we need to prepare for ourselves with this U.S. imperialist offensive against the People's Republic of China. Xi Jinping presenting an optimistic, constructive form of socialism the reading this book has inspired me like reading that book actually made me want to like work out and read and and serve the people it's such a dope book i suggest everybody get a copy of that book um shout out to roberto shout out to juan shout out to itzel everybody in the chat thanks again dave peace out everybody i hope you have a, a great week um and dave please give my warmest greetings to everybody at the chiao collective and, and i hope you have a great day Thank you so much. Same for you and Antikonquista. Cheers. Well, Steph, peace out.